I'm Bjorn Eiler. I'm the co-founder uh, of the Khalif Eiler Institute and of Glitter Pill LLC. Um, I work uh, every day to counter violent extremism and build uh, healthy, peaceful, and thriving communities. Today on the show, we're going to talk about the silent radicalization within your organization and what you can do about it about the transnational patterns of violent extremism that not only cross borders, but also ideologies, faiths, and race, and about how the nature of community has changed, what you can do to ensure your community remains healthy, peaceful, and thriving, and so much more. Stay tuned. Congratulations. You are tuned into Dolph Barron's Leadership and Loyalty Show, the number one podcast for Fortune 500 executives and those who are dedicated to creating a quantum leap in leadership. Your host, Dolph Barron, he's an executive mentor to leaders like you, a contributing writer for Entrepreneur Magazine, CEO World, and he's been featured on CNN, Fox, CBS, and many other notable sites. Dov Barron is an international business speaker who was named by Inc. Magazine as one of the top 100 leadership speakers to hire. Now, over to Dov Barron. Welcome, dear friends, fans, and fellow aficionados of Leadership Excellence. Thank you for joining us on this episode of the Leadership and Loyalty Podcast. I'm your host, Dov Barron. I'm here to assist you tapping into the one thing in your business that changes everything by transforming meaning into action. Curious to know more? Simply go to Dov baron.com that's d-o-v-b-a-r-o-n.com now the last few episodes of this show we've been focused very much on what we can do as individuals to create real change in a world that often seems to be spiraling into a darkening future uh we've spoken about this in many different ways we've had amazing guests like uh, gil winch who came, was with us from israel uh, speaking about diversity uh, in the um, in the disabled uh, people and people who had felonies and employing those people. We've had Tony McAleer, who talked about radicalization and how he was a neo-Nazi. We talked about Je- with Jeff Rottmeiler um, out of uh, Hong Kong, and we talked about homelessness in Hong Kong and uh, how we can help with that. And more recently, we've had Alex Budek of the... Um, of Berkeley Huss in California, we can all do something. But one thing is for sure, we can't fix a problem, even the problem in front of us, through denial. We must be willing to examine the darkest shadows of our society to discover the real and profound difference we can make. Well, that's the vast and intriguing journey we're going down in the next two episodes. Now, before we dive in, as always, we need your help in staying relevant. So please do us a favor, go over to wherever it is you're tuning into the podcast, we always need your help. Yes, we've been going a long time. We're very popular. Thank you very much for that. We, If you are a regular listener, we really appreciate that because through you, we became the number one podcast in the world for 4,500 listeners. And we were uh, honored to be and grateful to be cited by Inc.com as the number one podcast that make you a better leader. However, we still need your help. There's a, It's a very competitive uh, world out there in the world of podcasting, as I'm sure you know. And the more you can rate, review, and subscribe, the difference it makes. I really do appreciate it. All right, let's dive right in. Radicalization is real. There's no denying it. We can see it across the political lines, What, no matter what country you live in. You see it in places like Brazil, and you might go, oh, well, it's Banana Republic. But you can see it in America. You can see it in the UK. You can see it in Italy. You can see it in France. You can see it in almost any country in the world. So for most people, it's something terrible that we speak about in passing as a news story. However, what happens when radicalization goes from being on the news to becoming something in your local community, or worse still, something that is at your dinner table, meaning it's part of the family? It's only then that instead of quickly judging these radicals by whatever disparaging comments we might throw around, when radicalization makes its way into community or into your family, we find ourselves asking, why? Why would anyone go down that road? What can we do to bring someone locked into that very destructive behaviors? How can we bring them home? Well, that's where we're going with our guest in the next two episodes. Bjorn Eiler is going to be talking with us. He has, for the last two decades, been one of the leading voices in the global efforts to counter and prevent the spread of violent extremism 
and uh, that, of course, oftentimes leads to terrorism. Through his work, Bjorn has bo- uh, been striving for more principled approach to counterterrorism, building a universalist understanding of violent extremism as the denial of diversity. There's been uh, repression of ideologies. There's, there's all kinds of things that have happened that have become this bomb that is ticking away and he and his team have have created a universal effort an effort rather to create a universal declaration of human rights and principled peace building through these approaches beyond isla has worked to hold governments and companies accountable and help transform outdated efforts and structures to address the changing threat landscape and build safer communities uh, since 2016, he's worked with groups uh, with the group Extremely Together, which was Kofi Annan's foundation. Uh, you may remember he was the head of the UN to empower youth and civil societies internationally to change violent extremism in their local communities to work against radicalization across the globe. From 2020 to July 2022, Bjorn served as the inaugural chair and independent advisory committee for the Global Internet Forum for Counterterrorism. <laughs> Through his international work, he has worked with advising local organizations, national governments, private sector companies, and international mm-hmm. institutions such as the EU mm-hmm. and the UN. His work has influenced key strategies and efforts for more effective prevention to address radicalization and violent extremism. Um, So, ladies and gentlemen, let's put your hands together and help us welcome the peacemaker, or maybe the guy getting in in front of the the violence and the radicalization to help people find peace, Bjorn Isla! The crowd goes wild. Thank you, though. Good to have you here, mate. Thank you so much for being with us. Um, I want to start by, I know we talked about this when we talked offline, but I want to start by saying thank you. I appreciate the work that you do, the difference it's making for being a light in, in the darkness. And I know that you and I have many friends in common who are doing this kind of work, not least of all Tony McAleer. Um, and you, of course, have shared the stage with Tony many times. So this is important work. and. It, would, it could appear to be fairly thankless in a society that seems to be spiraling into the darkness. And in order to keep going, not for you, but for any of us, we need meaning. So what's the origin story of what gives your life meaning? I think there's uh, a couple of kind of distinct faces to mm-hmm. my work uh, mm-hmm. where like meaning has been found in different places. Um, and the first place um, was uh, where I grew up. I grew up in uh, Oslo, which is capital of Norway, uh, which is, you know, by most measures, uh, one of the best cities in the world to grow up in. Um, it's uh, enormously stable, peaceful, uh, safe, etc. But I grew up in an incredibly diverse neighborhood with people from all over the world. Um, people who looked like me, people who didn't look like me, people who uh, believed in the same things uh, I believed in, and people of all sorts of different fates. And so I learned very early on in my life that um, like diversity was a good thing, um, mm. that the fact that people from all over the place could come together and live together and not only coexist, but also thrive together mm-hmm. um, was um, an inherent value. And so um at the same time as I experienced that, uh, I also saw that uh, friends were being discriminated against. People didn't have the same opportunities even within the school system as I did. Um, and so um, like the driving factor for me became uh, working for equality and for everyone to like, be able to um, to uh, kind of live up to their potential um, mm-hmm. within that community. And so that led me kind of into the second phase because uh, I, I joined the Labour Party in Norway um, to, to keep working for these values. Um, and uh, in 2011, uh, some of you might remember, there was a major terrorist attack in Norway um, where um, 
Anders Bering Breivik uh, attacked the government headquarters in Oslo and uh, the summer camp of the Labour Youth Party. And I was at that summer camp and, and very nearly uh, got killed myself. Um, Breivik, of course, was driven by Islamophobia and by the great replacement theory and, and uh, these conspiracy theories we've heard a lot about uh, from um, extremists and terrorists in the last decade as well. Um, but um, like we were his target because we believed in fundamentally different things. Um, and that led me into like this phase where um, my main objective became um, to try to prevent other people from having to uh, go through the pain and suffering that I went through. Mm -hmm. um, I was suffering from PTSD. I of lost uh, many friends. Um, you know, it, it turned my life um, upside down and it was an incredibly painful experience. Um, lately, however, um, I've kind of tried to look at that and, and see like where... Um, do we turn like my life and my drive from being about like the worst thing that ever happened to me back mm -hmm. to being uh, like driven by positivity? And so sure. I would say like now I'm in a phase where I'm back to kind of the origins uh, of being driven um, by wanting to create a better future, a better society in which um, people can uh, have diversity and thrive and, and uh, you know, um, explore just the beauty of uh, the chaotic nature of the world in many ways. And so um, How that's kind of where I'm How many people died at. in that terror attack? Uh, 77. Wow. Yeah, I remember it, but I don't remember the details. Yeah. And so 77, they were all pretty young, weren't they? Uh, so, um, eight people died, uh, in a bomb blast in the city of Oslo, uh, who were of varying ages, uh, and, um, the youth camp was obviously a, a youth camp. So, so people largely below the age of, of, um, like 20, mm -hmm. um, uh, there were some, some, um, like grownups there as well. Um, and so there, there's some range there as well, but like, obviously, mm -hmm. um, a massive loss to so many families that lost children and uh to of all of like our parents as well who, yeah. who you know um were very near losing us and so so uh, yeah. what what's the population of norway uh like in terms of numbers or yeah uh yeah it's it's about five million people um right so this is the know, thing right tiny. so i want to address something here for anybody listening because <clears throat> As you know, I've done work around de-radicalization. I've spoken at the UN. I've done these things. And I want to address something, and I want to hear it from your point of view, particularly as you come from a country with 5 million people. Yeah. There's many cities in the, in the United States with far more people living in them as a city rather than as a country. So, <clears throat> you know, there's a lot of this talk about overpopulation. And however, what we know is, let's just look at some facts. Yes, we are hard on the planet. I'm not disagreeing with that. However, there is also other factors to be considered. For instance, as a, as a country becomes wealthier, the number of births go down. That's not my opinion. That's standard. Um, China birth rate has fallen below the repeat level. So this country that has the, the largest population will not have that largest population within two generations. India, on the other hand, will. They'll still stay because they're still having more. But again, as they get more wealth, they'll have less children. And then we've got these first world countries, including Norway, um, including the United States, Britain, Australia, New Zealand, et cetera, et cetera, who the, quote, privileged whites are having less children. And we've got disasters, whether that is war disasters, famine disasters, political disasters, whatever it might be, that's causing transnationalism. People are moving from one country to the next. That as you know, we saw Syria and other countries, we're seeing more and more of that. And those those people have to go somewhere. We if we're decent human beings, they have to go somewhere. And they're often going into countries like Norway with five million people. And suddenly you have a very large community of brown Muslim people 
who are not having children at the rate of one or two, but are in the rate of five. And so these nationalists often, often will get, you're trying to take us over. Now, I, I, me, I get what's the problem? Um, because if you want to keep a country, which is a fake, fake borders anyway, but if you, I mean, why is a Norwegian white? They're only white because white people grew up there, but Norwegians in three or four generations will likely not be white, as will most of the world will be some sort of beigey tones. Um, but that argument is still a solid argument, you know, in that they're taking us over from their point of view. It's a solid argument from their point of view. They're taking us over. So the reason I'm bringing this up is because you deal with this de-radicalization. And so you must be confronted with that, particularly in a country with 5 million people. And we just took this many immigrants in. That's that much percentage of our community. And they're... <laughs> they're they're multiplying like rabbits, and meanwhile, we we you know we're we're only having one or two children if we have any kids. How do you address that? Because I want to, if anybody's watching this or listening to this, thinking that argument, I want to hear what you, uh, how you respond to that with a person you're, who's in the radical situation. I think like the first step to um, any the radicalization process is really listening to the radicalized person right um of course trying not to um just apply like whatever model you have of what a radicalized person is to mm. that person but rather listen to like that person's specific personal experiences yeah. and worldviews um we tend to be like meeting people with um preconceptions and, and that's uh usually the worst thing you can do right in in mm -hmm. any context of course. um and so um like by doing that um the thing um you quickly get to is is you know, the roots of why someone believes in what they believe in and why they are fearing what they are fearing mm -hmm. um like the question of of um like replacement theory isn't um yeah. you know realistic as you say like borders are meaningless people have been moving around for like ever mm -hmm. um like norwegian culture is tied into like mediterranean culture etc in, in so many different ways right and so um these distinctions are largely things that we've made up they are mm -hmm. cultural norms they are um as i like to say stories we tell ourselves um and like my question is always how do we get people to tell better stories about themselves um aka how to get people to interpret their own situation in this world in a way that fosters healthier relationships between them and their surroundings mm -hmm. and what we see a lot of the times that the people who are um the most fearful um are um to some extent, uh, legitimately worried about things like their their economy, about yeah. uh, you know not having loving relationships, etc. And so, like figuring out what those root causes are, and then addressing that um, without uh, like going without kind of following them into the prejudices that often drives um, like their theories, and also introducing them to um kind of healthy examples of whatever it is that they are fearing like a lot of people in norway are enormously islamophobic having never really interacted with muslims right. um and so what they believe islam is is basically what newspapers has told them that isis believes yeah. um and like if you take the most radical of the radical terrorist organization in the world and you know apply that as the example of how to interpret like a fate that 1.8 billion people belong to from indonesia through like the rest of the world um you're casting a fairly wide net but letting a very very small um marginalized community define what that group looks like and so um well it's like saying all norwegians, all norwegians are vikings yeah, yeah I mean, it's like, like it's like Okay, there may have been a few, but is that a guy who's in the supermarket with you now? Sure. Yeah, also that was like a thousand like years a ago. So, yeah, but I mean, it's yeah. you know, it it's it's an example, 
You know, I mean, so uh, here's another example. There was, um, I'm sure you're aware of the truckers who all went to Ottawa and in Canada, right? Yeah. And, you know, uh, Trudeau called them terrorists and blah, blah, blah. Not a great move. Um, however, um, somebody was there with a Nazi flag. Yeah. And so the, the news said, you know, these are a bunch of Nazis. And I always say, you know, there's the, there's the law of groups. And the law of groups is very simple. If you find someone, if you want to find someone, you will find someone in that group. So if you go, you know, they're all transphobic, you can find a transphobic person there. You want to find a Nazi, there'll be a Nazi there. But that was also true in your church. <laughs> you, yeah. know, it, you know, so it's, but those things are the headlines. So yeah. you're fighting headlines a lot of the time in this work, right? Yeah. And, and we see that um, on kind of the side of, of things like Black Lives Matter protests as well, right? Like where a lot of the narrative was taken over by like uh, destruction of property and, and these things, which like very was a very small minority of what happened. And so right. like all of these things like take away from the understanding of the majority of people um, and like takes away from the range of like, really sane stuff that's happening within uh communities that are trying to grapple with um with their issues and so it's always a bit like taking it from the headlines and down to like what does this mean to um the individuals and the communities that are affected by by whatever the headline is right and so um but at the same time we're, we're like so good at essentializing whatever's mm -hmm. happening we're very good at the uh, soundbite very good at the headlines very good at the tweets um mm. and um it kind of takes away a lot of the complexity from any situation yeah and like part of my work is always getting people to appreciate the complexity not not to fear complexity because like quite a lot of the time where like complexity is confusing mm -hmm. um but rather to um like take the time to truly understand the complex nature of, of any issue and and see like what are well, the sides I, here. I think that you know i've said this a million times but i i don't mind repeating it over and over which is we're very focused on content and we're we're completely ignorant of context yeah, right. I think like and, and one that, of my sayings is like in a world where everyone's a broadcaster, like everyone stopped listening to each other. Right. And so, yeah, as a broadcaster, so, I'm sure you can you know, understand. What, so, you know, what is the context of a situation? So let's go back to addressing the thing I spoke about right in the intro, which is, you know, this stuff's going on the news. We're getting those headlines. And then suddenly something happens in your community. Um, or Worse still, it's at your dinner table. You suddenly find out that your kid or your cousin or your uncle is spouting radicalized language, and you fear that that, of course, can accelerate into whatever it accelerates in. How do you, like, because I want to look at, you know, this, the really what people don't understand is the nature of, ex, of violent extremism. And, and how do you confront that? For instance, in your own family, how how do you how does somebody confront that when they're they're sitting across the table from somebody they love, who's behaving like crazy, or sounding crazy? I mean, I think I think we've all sat around the dining tables with with people who <laughs> sound crazy to us. Like that's sure it's part of the nature of having dinner. I think um, well, the nature so, of families. <laughs> yeah, sure. that too. Um, I think like. Mm, one one thing I was saying for for like quite some time and still kind of subscribe to is um, I was living in Istanbul and on my street there were uh, a couple of synagogues, a couple of churches, and a couple of mosques, and like everyone went into their houses to pray. Uh, but then at the end of the day, like everyone came out to the same street and like sat down and had tea together. And so there was something there, and like sharing a meal is a good start. Um, yeah. It's it's uh, a place where where conversation can actually happen. So like appreciate that first of all, but also um, again it comes down to like understanding not just like the content of what's being said said, but 
where it's coming from. Like we, uh, flat earthers is uh, an example that uh, I like. It's relatively harmless to believe that the world is flat, but it's you know kind of wacky from uh, my perspective. But when you like listen to uh, flat earthers, you realize quickly that it isn't so much about them believing that the world is flat as about them a finding a community in like the group of people who believes that the world is flat and finding an identity and like being the wacky person who believes that the world is flat and so like that draws attention and like these people are like basically asking for attention um and so giving that uh, but in a healthy way that like challenges them to reflect on this is is um one way of dealing with it right and so like those are are a couple of the factors that plays into pretty much anyone who's going into a direction of um whether it be conspiracy theories or the more nefarious um extremist ideologies is like, yeah. listening to that right well, the truth of the matter is, and I've, I've discussed this with uh, social sci scientists and others, I mean, the truth of them is that almost any conspiracy theory has grains of truth in it. And, and you, if you hone in on those grains of truth and, and you're looking for something, then sure, you've got a decent argument, but you've got nothing that will hold it in place. Oftentimes, not always. Yeah, because some conspiracies are very real, and they, you know, and we we know that now looking at history. However, you know, you you bring up something that's really important, and I'm going to respond to it from a psychological point of view, um, because one of the things that I talk about is we part of the problem with radicalization, and this is the work I did with Tony is that people need a place to belong. Yeah. And they will trade belonging for fitting in as a second choice. And so they will change their own beliefs in order to fit in, and they'll, dis they'll disenfranchise parts of themselves in order to fit in. That's different than belonging. So the other part of that challenge is developmental, and that is this. Excuse me. Um, the part you. of that is this, is that... Um, the second phase of life is I'm not you. So I'm sitting around with my family who are all liberal and, and they're all talking about liberal ideas. And, and I'm like, you know, I'm a conservative, not because I want to be a conservative, but because I don't want to be you. Right. Yeah. And we're talking about um, in, in recent social science uh, research is that many of the radical uh ideas of gen z are to um <clears throat> are to be straight um church going individuals because it's radical for a bunch of people who are now deciding that they're sexually fluid or, or pan or whatever it is and they're dying their hair purple and they're having nice short haircuts and wearing shirts and ties because it's not because it's not conformity, it's a radicalization away from. And so this is the thing. So when you're that person sitting at your table, you know, you also have to look at that. A, do, where do they belong? Where do they yeah. fit in, which is different? And are they pushing against you because they're, they're psychologically in that developmental stage? These are all things to be considered, but we want to whitewash things and say, this is the way it is. These people are all nut jobs as opposed to, your approach and the work that you're doing, which is, I, th I think it would be fair to say that it's built on listening. Is that a fair comment? Yeah, I think so. And like, but that's also, it was like a thing I, I, I took away from, from my work with uh, Kofi Annan as well was like, reality is like listening is is the key to resolving mm -hmm. uh not just in terms of resolving conflict between two people but also in resolving conflict within one person um a lot of the time um when people are given the space to talk freely about themselves and what they believe in like with even fairly far down the the road uh, extremists i found that they start arguing against themselves because their mm -hmm. belief system doesn't actually make sense. And so right. once they get to explore that, um, 
in a deeper conversational setting um, where they also feel that they are being valued as an individual, they are being heard, they are being seen, they are being, you know, listened to. Um, that in itself can be a, a really effective tool for um, helping people off that path. And, and quite often, like when it comes to, as you're saying, this rebellion, uh, almost uh, like we've all been teenagers. Uh, well, and so uh, we've all been through that phase. Are, right? Some of us are 60 and still t- teenagers. <laughs> right. And, and so like, we all like define ourselves quite often in oppositions to others exactly but it's worth also remembering that like we define ourselves in the moment we don't define ourselves necessarily for life and so people change uh, a lot during a lifetime mm-hmm. appreciating and knowing that and knowing that people will learn and change and um like find other contexts within which they fit better um is is definitely part of it and like appreciating that but also appreciating that like i don't have always thoughts that align with each other perfectly right and so um appreciating that people in themselves in the moment are also complex Mm -hmm. um that we also have all of these different factions within ourselves um they are always there and so um like figuring out how to um pull on the ones that are bringing people back in the direction of reality if they've gone down um a conspiracy theorist uh rabbit hole for instance is you know it's still in there and so uh digging it out uh being an archaeologist uh is sometimes part of it as well right yeah you know it's it's interesting because you talked about in in the very beginning of, of this part about growing up in Oslo in, in a diverse community. <clears throat> and I, I too, you know, uh, we talked about where I was from, but I, you know, I grew up with my mates who were Jamaican, who were Indian, who were Pakistani, who were, you, you know, everything, <laughs> black, yeah. white, green, and purple. I mean, you know, everything. Um, it, and it's interesting because for me, you know, I think the the statement "I don't see color" is stupid, um, because then you then you're really an idiot. But I, I I saw color, but not as a as a separation. It's like, oh, you know, I'm going over Dave's house. Which Dave? And I'd use a disparaging comment. I was a kid, you know, Packy Dave, and yeah. I'd go over to his house, and I would call Packy Dave, Packy Dave to Packy Dave's face. And he wasn't offended, no more than when they said, oh, I'm going over to Dove's house. Who's Dove? Oh, he's the Jew who lives down the corner. Right? It was not, it wasn't like, it wasn't insulting, which is a way to understand each other uh, or even understand the fact that it was three Daves. Um, having that community, though, um, for me, set me up to be like you, which is I didn't see people as different than me. I saw them, I mean, different cultures and different traditions, but, you know, we're all just people. And we yeah. could have a laugh and we could joke around. At the same time, there are people who came out of those same very poor communities who were threatened by that. And, you know, I'd really like to hear your thought on why you think some of us, like you and I, come out fighting for diversity because we've grown up with it. And others come out very much against diversity because they've grown up with it. And yeah. by the surface of it, we all appear to be poor. We all appear to be growing up in this environment where, you know, the contest for jobs is equal. And, you know, it, it seems like the circumstances are pretty similar, yet one of us is doing the work you're doing and another one of us is out there, you know, trying to burn down synagogues or mosques. Yeah. Or churches. Uh, oh, yeah, or churches. Uh, sure. we, we have had a fair bit of burning of churches by uh, far right extremists in our way. Um, but yeah, I, I think like what you're getting at there is um, like what what I've been talking about as as building strong positive identities. Mm-hmm. Like I'm fairly comfortable with who I am. Um, like and and fairly confident in life. Um, you know and and. Um, Part of that is like I grew up in in a healthy family and and all of these things, right? Um, 
other people who grew up in the same neighborhood didn't necessarily have the same experiences at home and and um you know um people's lives even if on the surface they look similar are different um and so um a lot of what it comes down to um is this construction of of a strong positive identity of mm -hmm. building comfort with who you are so that you don't feel threatened by someone else being different from you um and you know um there there's ways of doing that and of creating that space for people at any stage in life um but it's also like the earlier you get to that the better right um and so a lot of that comes down to like how do we um create experiences where people are allowed to explore themselves um and understand that like that in itself um will not lead to you being ostracized or or you know kicked out of your community um so like that level of inclusiveness even within like a family unit um mm -hmm. is important also um doing that in the educational setting in schools and kindergartens etc where you know like I, I had a really excellent class throughout elementary school. Like everyone kind of got together. Like, of course there were like fallings out here and there. Um, but like that in itself, I think like gave me that comfort to be who I am. Mm -hmm. um, and everyone kind of appreciates that in different ways, but still. Uh, and so um, I think creating healthy local to the really really macro level communities right. um is a really important part of creating healthy identities as well and i want to talk more about that in part two of the show about creating these communities and the importance of that because you know like i said i i told you where i grew up um i didn't grow up in a good family i grew up in a crazy family with all kinds of de destructive behaviors um but there was something about me that was different, which was I was deeply into self-inquiry from a really young age. And so that pulled me away from the crowd. Whereas I know that others, you know, like I said, people want to belong, but they choose. And I really want people to get this. We trade belonging for fitting in. But if you trade belonging for fitting in, you have to shave off and disenfranchise parts of yourself in order to be part of that. And once you do the self-inquiry, you begin to question those things. And really, the, the most compassionate person is the person who's done the self-inquiry to go, oh, I get it. I'm you. <laughs> I get it. I, I can go off on that tangent, too. And suddenly recognizing, because, you know, when Tony and I were questioned at the UN, I told you about this, and they said, how could I, you know, a Jewish person, help Tony McAleer, a neo-Nazi, de-radicalized. And I said, because I live in the mirror. He's not, I didn't see the, the uh, radicalized neo-Nazi. What I saw was a young, intelligent, articulate man who needed a place to belong. I'd been that so I could have compassion. And I think that that's what we, and I want to say that's much easier said than done. You, it takes practice, but it's only possible through self self-examination self-knowledge we got a lot of places to go i want to talk about your work internationally I want to talk about building communities I want to talk about hold you've been holding companies and and large organizations accountable for doing this work because a lot of it is claptrap i want to talk about all those things in part two um before we do before we go to part two i'd love for you to tell people how they can find out more about you about your organizations and how they can reach out to you and, and potentially bring you in um to do whatever work needs to be done yeah so um as we've been talking about um all this session uh a lot of my work uh is with building building healthy and thriving and peaceful communities uh that work is mostly done through the khalifa Eller institute which is um uh, my nonprofit organization um i also run uh, uh along with my co-founder samantha kuttner um Glitter Pill LLC, which is uh, a company through which we do 
consulting work, uh, supporting um, companies uh, that are dealing with um, extremism in different ways, whether that is abusing their services, uh, platforms, and tools for spreading extremist, extremist propaganda, mm -hmm. or whether it is um, helping out uh, in um, assessing risks to those organizations. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So Go is to, there a particular URL you would send people to? Uh, KhalifaEiler.org and GlitterPill.io. Okay, we will make sure that those are posted, of course, in the show notes, and we'll add some others and other ways in which you can reach out. Thank you, Bjorn. It's been a pleasure so far. I'm really excited about part two. We can get into the part two of this. And remember, dear listener, dear viewer, you have to stay conscious. You got to stay curious. And, and that really, as you know, it's over my shoulder there. Staying curious, particularly about the person who seems to be so different from you. If you can get curious about how you might be the same, you're going to make a lot of difference in your own life as well as in the lives of others. We're going to be back in just one click. So stay curious, my friends. Stay curious. We'll see you on the other side.